And our next speaker will slightly sort of touch, talk about this from a, another perspective. Uh, and he's a literary scholar and senior lecturer at Malmö University. Um, and here he's going to talk and introduce the philosophical framework of deconstruction. Uh, his name is Bernd Clavier, and I really want you to give him a warm welcome. Thanks, Martin. And thank you, everybody, for coming here. And I was just thinking about the cabbage, um, which is actually called Swede, right? This is a Swede. That's, that's neat. Um, <clears throat> so, deconstruction. What is it? Um, it's, it's a word that is very famous. It's a word that is uh, very often buzzed around. And... Um, very often it just means that everything is falling apart or that things are not the way they ought to be. Things are deconstructed, they're, they're slipping away. Um, that, that is, that's what it means if you're a conservative. If you're a, 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 a radical or a progressive, uh, deconstruction means simply critique. And, um, and, and that's how it looks in, in popular culture. Uh, deconstruction became... Uh, a real buzzword in the 80s and 90s, late 80s and, and, and early 90s. And there were um, brands that were called deconstruction, clothing companies that used deconstruction to, to, to sell their products. I, I think Newsweek in 1992 had a whole issue devoted to deconstruction. Um, but one of, the, one of the moments of deconstruction in, in popular media that stuck to my mind was was the Woody Allen movie, Husbands and Wives. And I know it's me too now, and Woody Allen perhaps, we have, <laughs> maybe I should rethink my, I, I really love his film, so I, I can't help it. But they're all the same, and, and this one is also uh, like, like, like they all are, set in Manhattan, and it's about two couples that are married, one, of, one is breaking up, and, and this causes anxiety in Woody Allen's character. And uh, so he starts thinking about having an affair with one of his graduate students. He's, he's, a, he's a university professor. And the graduate student, played by Juliette Lewis, is working on a dissertation called Oral Sex in the Age of Deconstruction. And, and when, Woody Allen character, when Woody Allen's character finds this out, I think his name is Gabe, uh, he becomes obsessed with the word deconstruction. And deconstruction becomes to him what is going on in his marriage and what has happened to his best friend's marriage and what is happening to Manhattan in general. Everything gets deconstructed as they go. And another thought that comes to my mind, I'm pretty old, was when Ronald Reagan used the word deconstruction on his 1987 tour of Europe. And he came to Berlin and he was talking about the Eurosceptics that were really harming Western culture. And your skepticism to Ronald Reagan didn't mean what it means today. It means like you're skeptical of the European Union. Your skepticism to Ronald Reagan meant that you didn't like Western culture. You didn't understand Western culture as, as a primary culture. Or you criticized Western culture. And, and, and Derrida's deconstruction was sort of named by Reagan as, as one of the problems of, of Europe. Uh, and, and, of course, the problem being even greater because it had spread to the United States and was now doing all kinds of harm in, in, at the universities, which, of course, Reagan knew very well because as a governor of California, he uh, was very much uh, um, devoted to, to limiting the damage of, of radical <laughs> university professors by, by making campuses in the woods, in the redwoods, so that they would be far away from cities and not cause the havoc that they caused in the 60s. So uh, I'm happy to say that all these ideas uh, of, of deconstruction have, have very little to do with what, uh, what Derrida's work is all about. So I'm going to try to give you a sense of what I think is the essence of what Derrida is, is doing. And it's much more um, similar or in line with what we see on the walls here. This would be, I think, 
uh, Derrida would say this is the first step in a deconstruction. So this algorithm has, has decoded national anthems and made word groups out of them. And, and now we can begin to see how the words of national anthems are, are, are working. And uh, the next step in the deconstruction would then be to, to try to understand what that means and to spell that out. So <clears throat> in order to understand what Derrida is talking about, I think we have to view deconstruction as a philosophy of language. We have to look at it as um, an attitude uh, towards language, not as a system or as a method or actually as a coherent theory, but, but simply as pointing towards something in language that is essential to language and that will cause problems for the kind of purity that the national anthem is trying to produce. But in order to understand that, we have to go back into history and think about how we have understood language and, and where deconstruction comes into that understanding. And of course, all human beings, all mankind, as long as there have been speaking people have had thoughts about where that speech comes from, right? And, and most of the foundational myths contain a, a chapter on how mankind received language in almost all cultures. And if we turn to our own Judeo-Christian culture, um, there is a section in Genesis, and I wish I knew the Bible by heart, but I, <laughs> I've written down the section here, that goes like this, and it's uh, chapter 2, uh, and it's uh, um, 19 to 20. Uh, no, book 2, uh, 19 to 20, right? Genesis 2, 19 to 20. And here it goes. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast uh, of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all, the ca all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. That's the King James translation. So the idea is that these words have rained down from God. Right? That's, that's the general idea of most of, of, of the mythic understandings of language. But you would be surprised how, how long this understanding of language gripped science. If we, if we look at, at the history of the philosophy of language, if we look at the way in which scientists have thought about language, the idea that God somehow installed language into mankind is an idea that runs all the way up to the 20th century. Um, uh, in the Renaissance, um, uh, I, I really like the way the Renaissance thinkers thought about this. Uh, and my, my favorite example is an Italian uh, called Aldrovandi. Um, and and he, like all the other big Renaissance thinkers, uh, natural historians, they were called, and natural historians, they basically covered everything, <laughs> so they also covered language. Um, they saw the world as a huge, as a huge hall of mirrors. The universe was a big, big hall of mirrors created by God, and everything was mirrored into everything else. The planets were mirrored in the internal organs of man. All the, every species of bird had its equivalent species, species of fish in the ocean. So everything, everything that God had created was this huge, huge mirrors, mirror, and at the heart of this this hall of mirrors was language, was signs. So God had spoken the world into being. And the, um, the idea was that the natural historians, sorry, I'm stepping on the reclaimed material. The natural historian, the job of the natural historian was to, to trace these mirrors. And I'm going to give you an example. This is from Aldrovandi's um, masterpiece, Historia Serpentum et Draconum from 1640, the history of the serpent and the dragon. And this is chapter, the chapter called On the Serpent in General. It's one of the first chapters. Um, and it's arranged under the following headings. These are the headings of that chapter. 
equivocations, which means the various meanings of the word serpent, synonyms and etymologies, differences, form and description, anatomy, nature and habit, temperament, coitus and generation, voice, movements, places, diet, physiognomy, antipathy, sympathy, modes of capture, death and wounds caused by the serpent, modes and signs of poisoning, remedies, epithets, denominations, prodigies and presages, monstrous mythologies, gods to which it is dedicated, fables, allegories and mysteries, hieroglyphics, emblems and symbols, proverbs, coinage, miracles, riddles, devices, heraldic signs, historical facts, dreams, simulacra and statues, use in human diet, uses in medicine, miscellaneous uses. So to a natural historian, that was the serpent. Everything put together like that. And behind the reason why that could be put together was that the words had rayed down from God and they all mattered. Now, a hundred years later, people would begin to laugh at this sort of shambolic list of converging and diverging interests. Um, French uh, philosophers like Buffon would, would use Algravandi as a bad example of somebody who does not erect a system that, is, that has a structure. And, um, Perhaps the only Swede famous uh, internationally at this time was Carl von Linné, who produced this huge system of, of, of Latinate names for, for the flora and the fauna. And um, he too uh, has, has coined a, a really interesting uh, uh, um, aphorism. Uh, and he says, in Swedish, om man inte känner till namnen saknar man också kunskap om tingen. So if you don't know the names, you also do not know anything about the things. And this sounds nice, but it's actually meant to be taken quite literally. Linné devised the system of names in Latin uh, to, uh, to be, for us to be able to see the differences between the, 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 the species of plants, for instance. And he knew that the system was arbitrary, but he had the idea that it was only arbitrary now. At some point, God's system would be discovered. So it was just simply a working system, a kind of a, a system to be developed into the system of God. And the dream that Linné had was, of course, that he would have a conversation with God about God's creation. Now, we have to move... Um, all the way, uh, we, we don't have to move a century across uh, 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 time, but we have to move to England to find the first person who actually questions the idea that all this rains down from God. And that is John Locke, who begins to understand, or he begins to formulate that language cannot come from God. It has to come from man. And what's more, language is arbitrary, he says. Because if it's not arbitrary, there would be only one language. But since there are many languages, quite, you know, that means that there has to be some arbitrariness to the way in which we assign meanings to words. Now, this arbitrariness was a, a, a huge concern for the next 200 years until a Swiss philosopher of language called Ferdinand de Saussure began to to think about Locke's, uh, 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 Locke's analysis. He, he, he started questioning, what does it mean that language is arbitrary? What does it actually, what kind of consequences does it have? And one of the great consequences that, that Saussure discovered was that meanings of words depend on differential relationships. So there is no meaning in the word itself, there's only meaning as far as it is not what the other words are. So language is a huge system of differences. So um, uh, as a linguist, he was mostly interested in, in, in uh, uh, spoken language. Linguistics was mostly interested in, in spoken language at the time. This has changed now. So, you know, like he was wondering, how do, how do we know the difference between hog and dog, for instance? And, and, and it hasn't got anything to do with the words in themselves. It's the list 
of sim similar words that are different that makes us able to make these distinctions. So this is what's going on here. Um, and now Derrida comes in. I'm making this very quick, right? Now Derrida says that, well, Cecile is right up to a point because Cecile decided that the system that allows these differences to be heard is called law. And as I speak, the differences that I'm able to produce myself, he called parole. So parole is just French for, for speech. And long is the actual language, the actual systems, system of differences, which is kind of hidden in the everyday act of speaking. Now Derrida comes, out, comes along and points out that the long that Saussure has named actually doesn't exist. The long is never actually there. The distinctions that we are able to make between these words are not discernible in speech. The differential relation is not spoken, it's not itself spoken. So the differential relation becomes a mystery of language. Where is it? Where is this differential relation located? We only have speech, individual speaking, these paroles. We never see a law. So we never see the system of differentiation itself. And this is, of course, what Derrida then uses in order to develop the linguistic theories of Saussure into philosophical and political theories of meaning. So what he discovers is that language is differential only insofar as we make these differences. And to make these differences, we depend on boundaries. So language becomes a way of not just signifying things, but walling things in. Language is not just simply an act of communication, but it's a way of making insides and outsides. And the deconstruction that Derrida wants to suggest is to show how um, something like a national anthem produces these insides and outsides, activates these differential relations. And in his, uh, in his writing, he has several examples of, of, of this, but the most interesting one and most relevant, I think, for, for this exhibition is when he's talking about the, the Greek word pharmakon, which was the scapegoat that the Athenians tortured and killed whenever Athens was afflicted by problems. So whenever, whenever the city of Athens was afflicted by a plague, you had these pharmakai that you took out and you tortured. Usually you cut out their genitals. It was usually men, and it, has, it was a very extensive, and they died as a consequence of the torture. But it was this sort of act of horrible, horrible torture that was there to purify the city. And so this, 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 this pharmakon talk is all over Socrates' texts, but especially in a text called Phaedra, Phaedrus. And, um, and Derrida shows a very brilliant example how the idea of this outside, this pharmakon, which is the poison, the magician, the, 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 the horror, the evil, is nurtured inside the city, right? To be activated when the city is in need. So Athens, as a healthy, living, democratic city, needs to keep these people alive, feed them, so that they can be used in this way when they, they are needed. So the point that Derrida is trying to make is that Athens, the inside of Athens, is dependent on this outside. This, this evil outside that it keeps 
inside itself to sacrifice when, when the need is there. And I've been doing, for the last three years, I've been looking at um, the way in which cultural projects have been used to integrate immigrants. And it strikes me, of course, very often how precisely this, this structure um, plays out in our societies over and over, how the immigrant really is needed um, to be able to produce the Swedishness into which the immigrant needs to be integrated. In most of these integration project, projects that use art, um, the people who are, are doing it, the artists who are involved, don't really have a strong sense of, of what is Swedish. But there is a sense of what is Swedish as soon as there is an immigrant. As soon as there is this outside that needs to be integrated, you can have a sense of unity that you don't even have to pin down but that becomes activated because of the presence of the immigrant. And here is where I think that Derrida's deconstruction becomes politically valuable today, is that if we really look at the purities with which we surround ourselves, purities of disciplines, take for instance, I'm, I was presented as a literary scholar, My discipline has, uh, and, and when I go up for promotion, when I become a docent, there's somebody who's going to look at the, my publications and going to say, that's not literary, that's not literary, that's not literary. So there's a purity at, at, at work in what we do. When every, every time this purity gets activated, a deconstruction would be to look at the outside that is necessary for the inside to be pure. Uh, music is another great example, you know, musical styles. How are they pure? You know, I was listening to the radio the other day about folk music and how uh, a musician, I don't want to name his name, uh, um, uh, was outed by the, by the folk music community because, because of the impurity in the music that he made. You know, it was there's some sense of, of Swedish folk music that had to, had to be kept pure, and the influences that he brought into it uh, created this enormous infected battle in the folk music, folk music scene. That, that's another example of, of, of these purities. And I think that the world is, is made out of these little purities that make us feel comfortable. And it's this comfort that deconstruction, of course, uh, targets. And in that sense, Woody Allen is right, <laughs> that deconstruction is an anxiety pill. It will take away the, uh, the sense of security that the purity that we surround ourselves with uh, creates. Time for food, right? Thanks. Thank you very much.